heavens. And his life is a 3,000 year old tradition of the people of Israel and the eternity of God. Mishmor le David, Adonai ni agur be'al lecha, mishkon v'har kod shecha, olech tamim v'po'el sedeh, v'dober emet il v'ho. Lo ragal al nishno, lo asa l're'e hu ra'a, v'chor pan lo nasa al perobo. Nivzeh be'enav nim'as, Ve'et yir'ei Adonai yechabed. Shba' v'hara v'lo yamir, k'aspo lo natan b'neshet v'shachad anaki lo laka. V'shay ene, lo yimor te'olam. Psalm of David, 1 of 15. Do we deserve to enter God's sanctuary? Can we merit a place in the presence of God, live with integrity, do what is right, speak the truth without deceit, have no slander upon your tongue, do no evil to others, do not mistreat your neighbor, spurn a contemptible person, but honor those who revere God. Never retract the promise once made, though it may bring you harm. Let no money at unfair <coughs> lend no money at unfair rates, except no bribe against the innocent and the deeds of your own. Then shall you stand firm forever. Psalm 43 is traditional. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pasture. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in straight paths for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Thou art with me, I rod and thy staff, and comfort me. Thou prepare a table before me, in the presence of my enemies. Thou hast anointed my head with oil, my cup with it over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalm 34. Come, my children. Listen carefully. You will learn what it means to fear God, who is eager for life. Who desires to hear the good fortune, guard your tongue from speaking evil, your lips from deceitful speech. Can evil do good? Seek amity and pursue it. <laughs> Eliyahu ben Yehoshua Pesar. Eli Nakinson Evans. Passed away earlier this week in New York at the age of 85. Complications to the COVID. And has now come home to rest here in his homeland, in beloved city. Next to his dear wife, Judith, and near his parents, Mud and Sarah. Eli, welcome home. You have made us all so proud. To Josh and Jenna, friends, family, Bethel in our community extends its deepest sympathies to you. You lost, but we offer our love and our profound respect for all that the Evans family has done for this congregation and community all through the years. Eli was president emeritus of the Charles H. Preston Foundation, where he served from 1977 to 2003. Eli was a distinguished graduate of UNC Chapel Hill as an undergraduate for received by Beta Kappa Award in Yale Law School. 
In 2004, the Renaissance Foundation honored Eli by giving a major gift to the Carolina Center for Jewish Studies. Oh, that will establish a program in Evans' name that supports outreach activities on campus and in the community across North Carolina. In addition, it funded an annual scholar in residence program in Chapel Hill, and it's now a popular public lecture program. From 1958 to 1960, Eli served in the U.S. Navy. In 1964, he became speechwriter, President Lyndon Baines Johnson, then subsequently worked for Terry Sand, former governor of North Carolina and former president of the before heading to Redson, he worked for a decade with the Carnegie Corporation until he took over at Redson in 1977. In his early years at Redson, Eli was instrumental in planning and funding that got Sesame Street started in Hebrew and shown in Israel as Rehob Sumsu. He also facilitated its translation into Arabic as in which became a Palestinian-Israeli co-production, which forced into cultural dialogue and more. All this while writing the provisions, which first appeared in 1973. Willie Morris, editor at the time of Harper's Magazine and distinguished Southern author, Praised and welcomed Eli's work and described it as a personal pilgrimage. And then, after reading the provincials, noted that the Jews and Southerners were very much alike, stepchildren of an anguished history. After Eli's other books appeared, Judith Benjamin and Lonely Days were Sundays, 1989 and 1994, respectively. Morris described Eli as the most eloquent and knowledgeable voice in our nation of the Jew self. Its deep terrains and emotional cadences. Soon after taking the helm at the Revson Foundation, Eli came up with the idea to do a major TV series of Jewish history to be called Heritage, Civilization, and the Jews. Narrated by Abby Eben and produced by public TV channel WNET in New York. Eli invited both Carol and me to be on its planning committee and a few overseas shoots. And we were especially, we especially love traveling to New York for those planning meetings, which were exhilarating. And many of the voiceover presentations, Abby Eben were directly taken from those conversations and transcriptions at WNAT. They ultimately appeared in the book by even of the same name, Civilization of the Jews. It was never even during those years who described Eli in this way after reading the provincials. The Jews of the South have found their poet laureates. Had it not been for Eli and his savage familiarity with TV and the media, not to mention dealing with such a public figure as Abbott Eben, the series might have failed because when Eben went to view the final film and, and his editing, he didn't like the way he looked <laughs> in a safari suit. <laughs> so he demanded to do all the stand ups all over the world, including at Mount Sinai in a suit and tie. He liked the way to bring this up and bring the series home and play Kate. He made the first challenge I can tell you. And the series, as all of you must know, realize, was a huge. But perhaps Eli's greatest success in the eyes of his parents, but Sarah came in 1981 when he married his Bashir, his predestined bride, the love of his life. Judith London, a traditional Jew from Montgomery, Alabama, after graduation from Emory in Atlanta, 
went on to a distinguished career at TIA Prep in New York. Josh arrived a few years later. And what a bundle of joy he was to Eli and his parents. Eli wrote Carol and me a letter every single year after they did their annual photo of the three of them. And what a pleasure it has been to read those letters this week. And we remember with great love and affection, Judy passed away all too soon in 2008. And Eli's brother Bob, a distinguished CBS correspondent, died in 2017. Eli and Bob were fortunate to have devoted and loving parents who imbued in them passionate commitment to social justice, love of Israel, and the Jewish tradition and its culture and values, and respect and appreciation for hard work and learning. But it was the shining example of his parents that showed them how social justice really worked. When his father, Manuel J. his mother, who was mayor six consecutive, consecutive terms from 1952 to 63, he helped Durham get through integration in a relatively quiet and peaceful way. Mud became famous for defying lunch counter, the lunch counter ban against Surrey Blacks at Evans United Department Dollar Store. How did the Evans get around it and get away with it? Well, they took the chair away. And Harry Golden of Charlotte called it vertical integration. <laughs> <laughs> no greens for a four lunch counter demonstration necessary in Europe. The Evans family was a beacon of light to the region and to the country. At that time, Eva was either in high school there or an undergraduate at UNC. And you can imagine. What an impression it must make on a young Eli. The impression is I've made <laughs> all these years later. Eli's rise to recognition in literary circles came while he had a full time job in the highly competitive areas of philanthropy and foundation. Reading. Much of his work was directed to Jewish causes. Never in all his public life did he forget his roots or his family ties himself. Named after his maternal grandmother, Jesse Bloom Dobbs, who was born in Woodward, and her husband, Eli, who together had eight daughters and one son, who were all North Carolinians. The Knoxons and Evans have had deep roots in North Carolina. I have a story about personal story about her <laughs> and North Carolina. I mean, soil, real soil from the land of Israel that many pious Jews to this day since antiquity have put in their coffins and interment to remind them of their love of Israel or hope for resurrection, resurrection there one day. When Josh was born, at NYU Hospital in 1985, Eli took a vial of dirt from North Carolina into the delivery room, and Eli subsequently wrote about this in his essay home, quote, with one hand, I held Judith's hand, and with the other, clutched the southern soil. I wanted Josh to know his roots. I believe that one had to create family legends early. So whenever I reported to my mother that Josh wanted his shoe door who was diving into some grits, Judith said on the other line, that dirt's working. <laughs> Sarah Evans died in 1986. And sometime after he, and I had the privilege of the funeral and we to some of you are old enough not to have been there. Sometime after. Eli had a tree planted at Hadassah Hospital with a plaque that says, Sarah Nottingham Evans, Hadassah Pioneer in the American South. Mutt died in 1997, 
And sometimes after that, he like called me and says, he would like to be in Israel when I was there. And he wanted me to visit the tree and see the flag at the Hadassah Hospital with him. He asked me to bring some soil, <laughs> mom and dad's grave, to put around the tree. We consequently meet up in Jerusalem. And Eli said, well, let's walk in the old city, show me around, see something about the new excavation there, which we did. And a hot summer day, you know how that can be, the afternoon, and Eli's wearing his sport coat. <laughs> so when we finish our tour of the old city, go out to Africa and try to hail a cab, which we did. And looking at Eli, well, good enough, his sport coat. He says, you guys want to go to the casino in Jericho? The Palestinians at that time were running a casino in Jericho. And a lot of people wanted to go there. And Eli and I said, no, that's a hospital, please. <laughs> By the way, that casino closed in 2000. As did the nine hole golf course that they built there also. We said no to the hospital and we were off to find the tree, which we did pretty readily. And I just found a picture of it in our evidence file, or rather, Carol cow did. So we sprinkled the soil on the roots of the tree and said a prayer. Eli turns to me and says, If you take a little soil from here, would you put a little on mom and dad's grave? <laughs> and of course, I just happen to have something, you know, to put it in because it brought it her from Norma. So I come home. I, I think I went to sleep and the next day over the Hebrew cemetery. I went to her. And a couple of stones to run it. On it with my Josh. When you visit the cemetery near the future, remember this story and maybe carry a small pup for sacred soil to the pup. <laughs> Eli came to Durham on April 14, 1980, for the dedication of Evans Hall at the Center for Jewish Studies at, on the New Campus, which acknowledged the huge efforts and gifts that Mud and Sarah Evans had made to both Duke and Carolina in behalf of Jewish studies. Originally, we had thought that a joint program between the two universities would be the most efficient way to build a program. But over the course of that first decade, the two programs went their own separate ways. And Eli really brought Carolina to a new and distinguished level of excellence when he took over the campaign years later. And at that moment in 1980, on the Duke campus, Eli reflected on what this commemorative bronze plaque in honor of the Evans family meant to him and his family. He began by talking about the giant magnolias near Duke Chapel, which he climbed as a kid. Our kids did too, by the way. How did he and his family, and how he and his family, Adored and respected Mary Trent Seams, scion of the Duke family. How Duke faculty consistently voted for Mayor Mud Evans for 12 years. And that sort of loyalty meant a lot. He also kidded quite a bit about the Duke Carolina rivalry. <laughs> and he praised his mentor, Terry Sanford, then at that time president of Duke for making Duke so inclusive, citing the figure of 1,100 Jewish undergrads at Duke at that time, 20% of its enrollment in the undergraduate college. He also said that year, Duke got Vince Taylor and G. Banks, but Carolina got Phil Ford and Charlie Scott. You know what that Eli noted that in 1980, that both Duke and Carolina were more racially integrated than Princeton and Yale. By tying Duke's future to Carolina's, Eli hoped that his dreams for the centers of Jewish studies would become quite an extraordinary program 
extraordinary beacon for Jewish Christian understanding by introducing Duke and Caroline students to their Old Testament roots in Jewish history. We dream that they will carry out the road, carry out their mission on both campuses and beyond. If our family's name becomes associated with such an endeavor, we will find ourselves Christ blessed by this great university and its sister institution at Chapel Hill, by the Durham community that has given back so much more than we could ever give, and by the fact that as Jews in the New South, we have today become firmly part of this region's history in a place where pluralism abides, diversity is celebrated, and our common heritage binds us all together in the family of man. That, that, that dedication of the Evans family flag on Duke's West Hills. Some of you truly proud of those remarks say it all. Published in the Durham Herald Sun on the editorial page. 42 years later, Eli's dream has become a reality. And our Jewish community here in Durham and Chapel Hill thrives as never before. Upon being inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Science in 2001, Eli recited for his, quote, dual contribution to American letters and for being a philanthropist of uncommon originality and leadership. What a legacy to leave, not just you, Josh and Jen, and family and friends, but to all of us who share the values and commitments reflected in his literary accomplishments and strategic plan. In his obituary, Eli quoted saying this, the sages tell us that every man should have a child, write a book, and plan a tree. Mm -hmm. Eli was blessed to fulfill all those wishes, and he used that Christ plus in his 1980s feet, and he took three other things, but he was six times flat. <laughs> I ended up up all correct. May he shame on oh, May Eli pay me for a life. We now we have a series of speakers who reflect on their relationship to Eli and the first of those is Roy Hoffman, writer, long time person. Thank you, Rabbi, Josh, Jenna. What an honor to be here to be asked to speak about Eli, the writer, my friend Eli, and his divorce partner. In 1986, I first met Eli and interviewed him in Manhattan for a New York Times article I was writing about the flowering of Southern Jewish literature and research. He'd already read my first novel, Almost Family, and I, his extraordinary memoir of vengeance. After our heartfelt conversation, I asked him to inscribe my copy of his book to Roy Hoffman, a soul made in the glorious search for understanding and conveying the Southern Jewish story. Just keep on, keep it on, old man. <laughs> With best wishes always, Eli Evans, June 6th. 1986. There it was, his easy warmth, his embrace, his supportiveness. But, old oh, buddy, we just met. <laughs> <laughs> but he sensed it. As we began our lifelong friendship, soon with Judith and Josh, Nancy, my wife, and our daughter, Mary, to be old buddy to Eli was a gift. He gave me so many. Committed philanthropist, brilliant legal mind, hard-working historian, Diane would have been enough. But he wielded a magic pen too, an inspiration for a younger writer like me. 
Summer was the special time he wrote of his Durham boyhood. The countless days melting together into a silken rush of yellow and pine, the warm, moist earth bursting forth with wildflowers and berries growing free. Beautiful. Walking down Main Street, he went on, I would always drop in on a few of the Jewish merchants who would give me a big hello and let me roam around their stores. Glad scenes, we fit the big man, had size 50 pants, two of us could stand in. Herman, Harry Berman's record bar had a few sexy girls on album covers we could take a long look at when we <laughs> pretended to play the record. <laughs> Finally, I would end up at our store to get a ride home with my mother and father. Evans United Dollar was just about the biggest store on Main Street, and it had my daddy's picture over the yellow. <laughs> That immense pride of family, the sly humor, the celebration of life. It was all there within the charms of story. And he wrote of this journey through the dark and complicated shadows, too. In the midst of the colonial days and the daughters of the Confederacy, he wrote, the soul of a Jewish Southern boy stirred with confusion as to struggle to understand. He felt none of the stain of Southern history, none of the dishonor after the defeat, none of the guilt over the inhumanity of slavery. All of that saturated the air, and he lived in it, wrestled with it, and tried to unravel the secrets. But his roots had hold of him and another one. He fixed on the mysteries of Poland, Lithuania, and Romania. Wondering what would have happened if his grandparents had not been courageous or maybe afraid enough to leave. Had they not come, he might have been trapped in the cruel battlegrounds of Europe. The power of history and gratitude. Searching, honest, eloquent. And in the topics he covered in the provincials, in a journalistic way as well, anti Semitism. Eight groups, Jewish Christian and Jewish black relations, he was perceptibly writing about today. <laughs> Over the years, well, Eli, I have and I with our I came to learn he did not just choose his pockets, they chose him. As he explained in the prologue of his biography, Judah P. Benjamin, the Jewish Confederate. At times, he wrote, I provide my own insight from the book because I cannot help but feel that even though our boyhood was separated by more than 100 years, Judah P. Benjamin is not remote. He is somehow familiar because there are certain changeless verities growing up Jewish in the Bible. That personal connection was so important to Eli in his writing, and as you know, in his relationships of all kinds. He was proud of the acclaim he got from other writers, Pat Conroy, Calvin Trillin, William Morris. And after Bill Ferris, William Ferris invited Eli to join Civil War historian Shelby Foote and Ruth's author Alex Haley on the Mississippi Delta Queen. For a symposium on the South, Eli with the lady and showed me the photo of all these great writers together and how he treasured a Hebrew copy of roots that Haley gave him with the words To Eli, the family of Kente wishes you shalom and expresses a family bond. Eli was a Southern Jewish writer, yes, but above all, an American, an important voice of our time, grappling with the big questions of our nation. And his books are not only again to us, but to the future, future readers and future generations as well. Eli's voice as a writer will endure.
Imagine my honor in 2004 when Eli, along with Arthur Lee, blurred my novel Chicken Dreamy Corn, saying it was, quote, a tale of sensuality told in a much language no, don't do that. I can hear it. who spans both worlds. I called up Eli and said, those words are a mirror of your own world. Eli, you showed me the way. Thirty years after his first inscription to me on the first edition of the Preventions, he signed a new edition of the Preventions, concluding, Roy, thank you for everything. Eli, thank you for everything. Old buddy. <laughs> Marcy Cole Ferris from the UNC Center for Jewish Studies and lecture at Lucas Hall Movie Nation. My husband Bill and I share our deepest condolences with Josh and Jenna. With Eli's devoted extended family and with his dear friends gathered here and in mourning across our region and nation. In the late 1970s, I enrolled in a folklore course during my senior year of college, where our assignment was to write about our folk group. Mine was Arkansas Jews, and to brew a dish for the class potluck dinner. And that was chicken that I fried in my tiny apartment kitchen. And I remember the Eureka moment when I found the Provincials of Personal History of Jews in the South by Eli N. Evans in the stacks at Brown University Library. It had just been published in 1973. As I opened the book and scanned its pages, I thought writing about my people. I also read Eli's essay in the groundbreaking anthology of the same era, Turn to the South, a publication of the newly formed Southern Jewish Historical Society, of which Eli was the founder in the 1970s. <clears throat> the title of his essay, Southern Jewish History, Alive and Unfolding, captured the excitement of the evolving field of Southern Jewish studies. Eli wrote in that essay, when I first went south to interview people for my book, I didn't know what to expect. One of my early introductions occurred in a talk with a man from Anniston, Alabama, a Mr. Stern from an old German Jewish family. What was Friday night like in Anniston, Alabama, I asked. And he answered, oh, it was memorable. First, and he lifted his hands up, mama blessed the lights, and then we settled down for our favorite Friday night meal, crawfish soup, <laughs> fried chicken, baked ham, and pop and John. <laughs> and sweet potato punch. And he continued to write to me. I knew then I had fallen down the rabbit hole <laughs> into the complex world of the Southern Jewish mind and experience. The Provincials was my doorway into the study of the Jewish South. And like Eli, I fell into that same rabbit hole. For the next 40 years, Eli was my inspiration, my mentor, my teacher, my friend in the field of Southern Jewish history and culture. I was honored to work with Eli at the Museum of the Southern Jewish Experience in Jackson, Mississippi, where he served as an important member of its board of directors. And then I soon was introduced to the magnificent Judith London Evans. And we spent many times together in Montgomery, Alabama, and Natchez, and in Charleston, and so many southern places in New York. And each year, I'm here, we received their holiday card that featured a growing Josh <laughs> and Bella. <laughs> when Bill and I came to Chapel Hill to teach at the University of North Carolina, I again had the honor of working with Eli, this time 
He was inspired by his beloved Carolina Blue, the Tar Hills, his hometown of Durham, and his family's Jewish legacy in the state and region. Thanks to the vision of UNC Development Officer Samuel, a Jewish studies program had just been proposed in the College of Arts and Sciences of Carolina. At a fundraising event in December, UNC Chancellor James Meeser said, we cannot have a world-class university without a Jewish studies program. It was a great privilege to work with the Center's advisory board members and with UNC professor Jonathan Hebb of Western Memory, who together created the Carolina Center for Jewish Studies in 2003, led by Eli, their founding chair. Today, 110 Jewish Studies courses are on the book at Carolina. A strong network of graduate students support the new place. More than 20 affiliate faculty members teach in 10 different academic departments. And over a thousand students take junior studies courses each year in so much large part to Eli. So Eli spoke in my Southern Jewish History Seminar each fall. That's the Glenn and the Riches, Sandra and Steve. And it had to be preferably on a day that coincided with Carolina Homes of Poetry. <laughs> and and here in the Jewish Center uh, board meeting as well. And he always arrived in class wearing his Carolina baseball cap. He would probably take my uh, dog ears copy of the credentials from me, and he would sit on the stool in front of class. Each year, students were assigned the provincial and wrote a critical essay about it from a still assignment. Everyone sat mesmerized as Eli wove the story of his Jewish self seamlessly integrated into the region history. Eli always pushed students to understand the power of their own lives as change makers and leaders. At the end of class, he continued to chat with students and chat and chat. <laughs> they have to go to lunch to be late for their next class. Then, without prompting, the class would stand, give him a standing ovation, and get in line. It's amazing <laughs> to have their copies of the provincial autograph and their photograph made with the line. And at least one's for Josh. <laughs> After class, as we walked through campus toward the Carolina Inn, Eli asked, How do I do? What's that? What's it letting you hope for? And I always answered, It was more than okay, Eli. It was life changing. So, being asked to write a eulogy for Eli Evans, very complicated way, sort of feels like being asked to paint a portrait of Da Vinci. Or write a write a poem, or uh, it's it's overwhelming to think about trying to sum up man. I love as much as I love you all. Good to that, and everyone finding his life pleasure. I don't know how to describe my relationship with you all. Saying that he was my parents' friend and put him in a box is far too small. So calling him my best friend's father. Same thing. I think I would say that I admired. Eli. It was very easy to admire Eli because he was an admirable man. Getting to know him was an adventure. Growing up at some point, I don't recall when, we started to notice that the adults in our lives were full people with their own interests and motivations. But no one was like Eli. A friend of Josh and mine once said that talking to Eli was great because there are actually only two kinds of conversations. One, 
where Elon is the world's foremost man. <laughs> and two, where Elon thinks your opinions are the most significant. In, <laughs> in those conversations, you might learn, as has already been brought up, with the people in the job, to help produce the very version of the And all that is cool. But what made Elon unique was the other conversation. When he just wanted to listen, share with him. Eli had a way of listening to you with his eyes that made you feel like the universe was a sphere about six feet across and you were in a geometric center. Even if you were talking about your high school English reader paper. That transfixing earnestness meant that sometimes Eli would say things that could make a teenager roll his eyes, but no one would ever roll their eyes to Eli. The summer that Josh and I were 14, our dad took us on a whitewater rafting trip from Green River to Utah. Three side journeys. Uh, there is no one in the world who is a better person to spend four days at the bottom of the canyon in the American West, cut off from technology with nothing to do but talk and take in the beauty of nature as you are not as evidence. Anyway, one of the families on this trip was an evangelical Christian family from Jacksonville, Florida. One afternoon on this trip, we were led up by the tour guides to some rock art painted by indigenous people thousands of years ago. One member of this family from Jacksonville said to Eli, How can you, as a Jew, believe that there are things in this world that are more than 5,700 years old? When the Bible our faith share so clear on us. And Eli responded in that way that he did. He said, I'm so impressed by your faith. He answered with warmth earnestness, so much so you might be able to call it grace. This man had such a wonderful mind. She gave him spirit and made it so hard to watch him. Those years after she was tired, as he started to deteriorate. As the years went on, he struggled to follow the conversation. Like a hipper, he couldn't catch up with the high class. Robin Eli Evans took his wit and his way with words seemed like a cool clip to take. But it was never that simple. Well, into his decline, I remember a dinner when we were all together. The way his face lit up when he was asked to pass the ball. This was something to do. This was something to give. This was something he could share. He loved to be a part of the group and listen, even when he couldn't participate in the same way anymore. And this revealed something important, something special to me about Eli Evans, the man. His way with words, his charm, made him great to be around. And I loved him for it. But what made him a great man, and since we're here in North Carolina, I should say what made him a gentleman, was the way that he loved being a good man around people. That was the core of his being. As a speechwriter myself, I'll always be impressed by the Eli you met when you heard him speak or read his writing. But the Eli Miss, the one I fully admire, the one who listened. This was a wonderful man who just wanted to be there because of how he made you feel, how he made you feel. He never lost that. Even just a few months ago, Josh would tell me the way that Eli would respond just sitting in a room, hearing people talk, listening to music. That was what Eli wanted to do, that was the core of his soul. He never lost it. And I know that I will never know, lose the memory how it felt to be around him. Thank you for everything. And that will voice come by the two more years. Well, the first. Oh, boy. I want you to ponder for a moment. The task ahead of me right now. I have to come up with the right words to speak about one of the finest wordsmiths that I've ever known. 
And you know what really sucks about it? In my past, whenever I needed to come up with the right words, I'm not getting called to be like editing and device. So I come up with a little bit of a solution here. I'm going to start my remarks by using the Eli's words himself. I'm going to read you a little bit from the credentials, some words befitting this fellow occasion. Um, from chapter 22, which contains Eli's reflections on the death of his mother, Sarah. I was going to start from a story about the dirt and Josh uh, being born. So instead, I begin with this and I get to be while reflecting on Sarah's funeral. Bob and I had decided that the funeral service should not have a grief stricken tone. It should be a celebration of a great and living life. And the community did not disappoint them in the response to it. There was an embracing quality in the mood of the service. As if the whole town were enveloping us in, in its arms. He then noted that Dr. Eric Meyer gave him the news. At the cemetery, each of us picked up a handful of herbs. A Jewish custom that asserts the loved one should not be buried, should be buried, sorry, by family and friends. We picked up a small pot of the North Carolina red clay. Mixed with black earth, all moist and rich with potential of spring, and broke it up in our hands. The sound of bits of earth striking the coffin resonated with Sarah's history in her life. It was something all members of her large family could do together a healing act of respect. As the group of all the family visited the weather tombstones nearby of Jenny and Eli having to be raised. Mom had picked the site just 40 feet away because on the day she visited there, she was able to see her mother and father's son to the spot where she would someday be buried. She had planned it that way so the family's memories would be blended and the generations unified. He led us on to write As I returned to New York, a taxi ride into Manhattan from the airport past the crowded cemeteries of Queens formed a depressing punctuation to the trip. It was a metaphor for the city itself. Anonymous and busy, too many lives, too little faith, people too hurried to form the attachments to ancestors and to the soil that is so much a part of the South that I had just left. Could I ever sink my roots in this place, you wonder? Like so many Southerners, I vowed I would not be buried in New York. Home would always be Durham. Even though I was now separated from my boy, but home physically, I felt more deeply attached emotionally to the place where my mother now rested. If you are wondering why a man who spent 50 plus years in New York is today being laid to rest in Durham, he like just explained himself. But as I said at the start of this, I'm also here to share my own words about what we. And as I thought about what I wanted to say today, my memories came back to me in ways. I recall so many times talking basketball with him, needling him the way only a Carolina, uh, only a Duke fan can to a Carolina. <laughs> I remember sitting in the living room at one Lexington, watching TV with him. So he fell asleep on the couch and started snoring next to me. I remember the joy on the faces of every child in the room. As he let us pull out his banjo at Passover to lead us in a round of dying in the world ballad before sun. <laughs> but the memories for me that sick the most are from the start of my adult life in my early 20s. Eli was a fixture on the scene in those years. And I want to share a few of my favorite stories. First off, at the moment in 1988, I was 21 years old. I was just about to start my senior year of college at Duke. I was working as an intern for CNN at the Democratic National Convention, Go to Cuts. A couple of weeks before the convention started, I had begun dating a fellow intern who was also working at CNN at the time. And so when Eli came to the convention, he said he wanted to meet her. At first, we kind of stopped the lockdown time with Eli. He was racing around saying hi to friends who were there. I swear he must have known half the delegates. 
But once we connected with him, he locked in, the Michael said. He was so thoughtful and warm as he got to know this young woman that his nephew had only known for a very short period of time. And after he'd spoken to her for a bit, in a quiet moment, he like turned to me and said, hang on to this <laughs> She's marrying Sarah. <laughs> I want you to talk about silly that comment for me. <laughs> he spent 10 or 15 minutes with this woman. Neither I nor my girlfriend were college graduates yet. We were certainly not looking for a lifelong relationship. We'd only seen each other a few weeks. We didn't go to the same school. We didn't live in the same city. And I was not someone who was thrown to long term relationships. And here was my only uncle telling me that there's a woman that I should marry. So you can probably get that story. You can record it. The young woman I was dating then, now my wife, Kathy, we've been together for 36 years since that time. And the moral of the story is Eli no good woman saw so one. <laughs> After college, Kathy and I moved to New York. She worked on Wall Street. I worked at CNN Business News and the youngsters living in New York. We did not have much money for anything other than our land. So Eli and Judith became our surrogate parents, our only source of entertainment for the most part of the city. They would take us out to dinner, especially on Friday nights, and we would come back in one last and celebrate Shabbat. Right? Eli got mixed season tickets so that he and I could go to games together. And I would often tell him that I could never pay him back for his generosity. And he always said, just do the same thing to us someday. Make sure that the younger ones of our family are always happy. That's how you can pay him. And he and Judith would take Kathy and me to uh, their house on Quash on weekends to get away from the city. Josh would like five or six at time. Um, and there was one time we were driving back and we stopped at the gas station to fill up. We had to go Josh was thirsty. Uh, you, you can hear the call again. <laughs> Josh was thirsty. And so Eli brought him a big gulp of Sprite. Josh downed it and then soon fell asleep in the back of the car, his head nestled on the cabin flat, his midsection draped across my legs. <laughs> <laughs> After a little bit, I asked Eli and Judith if Josh was probably sweating a lot. <laughs> um, my lap my lap felt kind of damp. <laughs> I guess it wasn't sweat. You like to think about a little too much Sprite before putting this sun upon my life. <laughs> when the time came for me to ask Kathy for her hand in marriage, I turned to Eli for help. I needed a ring. New York had a legendary diamond district where I was sure I could get the perfect stone. I asked Eli to come with me. He was all in. He exuded so much confidence, and that was important because I'd been very nervous. About your path. I was afraid that a young fool like me might get ripped off by these savvy diamond merchants. But now I have this wise and brilliant man at my side. I'm sure everything would go to much right. So we got the jewelers well. And I told Eli, I, I done a little bit of research, educated myself a little bit. I knew a bit about color, cut, clarity. Eli stood there quietly quiet for a couple moments, pondering, and then said, what do you call it? Cut <laughs> when I asked the captain stand and we called both our parents, we then rushed over to one that to share the news with Eli and Judith. I think I'm fairly sure that they were the first people to actually see the ring on Captain's finger. Eli immediately took us into Gramercy Park and took a photo of me and Captain sitting on a bench under one of the trees there. Eli had been smart with the New York Times over the years and claimed that he could perform a miracle. He could get our wedding announcement into the most important paper in the world. A few days later, he was true to his work. And alongside the story of Mr. Evans' engagement with the first song was the photo that Eli had taken. And as a result of that, Eli Evans was one of the few people in history to have both the writing and photo credit. <laughs> In the past few days, I've had so many longtime friends reach out to me, not just to offer condolences, 
but to talk about the times that they met Eli or heard him speak. Uncle E filled up a room. He made your day brighter. He was one of those rare individuals who left a lasting impression on every person that he met. So many people loved him. And in his honor, I want to close with two of Eli's favorite words. Shalom, <laughs> y'all. Number two. Number two. Uh, first of all, I didn't write anything. I'm going to speak from the heart. And part of why is because Josh told me who was going to speak, and I was like, "Can to write out of that for me? Ridiculous! I don't try." I'm going to tell you a little more about the the, the spirited, goofy side of Eli. Now, one of the things Eli and Bob, my father, taught us every time we spoke in public or spoke at the dinner table, we were politely critiqued for our ability to say something. <laughs> the power of the call. <laughs> Eli always said, he said, and the word um is not a word, <laughs> which makes it um difficult. <laughs> so, Eli and me for the first 14 years of my life, our relationship, we would talk all the time about Carolina basketball. Um, it wasn't until, I can't just say, um, right. it wasn't until Jason went to do that, the new part of that equation that came into the conversation, but we would talk for hours about Carolina basketball, who was they were recruiting, what was happening, what was going on. And when I was, I think, 14 years old, uh, right after, uh, Eli Judith got married. I was on the phone for like an hour and a half of Eli talking about the recruiting class at Carolina. And Judith picked up the phone and said, You guys have an issue. Yeah. I wouldn't know what's going on. And she said, Your relationship is entirely built upon Carolina basketball and nothing else. <laughs> Which I didn't use that. <laughs> and she challenged us to continue having conversations, but for the next six months, not talk about Carolyn back. <laughs> so I called him seven months later. <laughs> but it changed our relationship and it changed what he was able uh, to do to be a guy who was a mic for the people on the mic for the people on the And if Bob would say, take the mic, hold it right below your chin to your face. <laughs> um, he really changed a lot for me. You know, and I think about three pieces of advice that he made in life. And then I want to share something else that was super important that he gave me. But one was, and this happened, as, and it's meant a lot to me, and it's meant a lot for how we live our lives as a family. In 2005, Josh, Eli, Bob, and myself decided we were going to figure out a way to go get. St. Louis to the final four to watch Carolina with no knowledge that they were going to win. I said the worst experience could be spending a fortune to go and have them lose the first game, but they just rolled over the big ten and won by a lot, which was great. <laughs> but we were lucky to have the ticket to log in at the hotel and the cost of the whole thing. And then the tickets went up in price. And I can tell you my and Bob were starting to feel a little bit skittish about the cost of this trip. And I said, Eli, it's okay if you don't go. And Eli said, remember this. You can't put a price tag in memory. And for Josh and me, uh, I will point out to everybody, there's a big poster of Carolina of the National Championship game with the crowd right there. And the two people you can make out in the crowd are me and Josh. Because <laughs> we're standing out behind Eli and Bob. In that back row the front section. And, and we talk about this all the time in this game. And that advice has been something that I've taken with me and I still do. When we talk about family trips and traveling and free stuff, and you can't put price that in one, you also can't take the money with you again. So that was the first very important piece. A second thing, and it was a very goofy person. And that part doesn't come out as much in his professional life, but it's what, what we all live. And experienced and had you know the joy of experiencing was Eli's 
He has random goofiness and random advice. So the second piece of advice we're going to put put Brian on the spot here because he's not prepared for this, but hopefully you remember. Brian's about six years old, and Eli came to visit us in California. And I was at work, and I came home, and Eli said, where's Eli? And Lori said, he's not in her. And so I walk outside, and Brian and Eli in the backyard on the eight-foot roof. Brian's shooting shots. And I said, Eli, he said, stop. He said, Brian, who's your best friend? Um, and the last thing that he gave me that, that Jason spoke about it briefly was that the love of music and tradition around the Jewish holiday. So in our household growing up, we were the house for, for Passover. Um, our Passover Savior could be 30 or 40 people. Anybody who was in town. Uh, needed a place to go for Passover, would come to our house. Mud and Sarah would come in. Eli and Josh would come down from New York. It was a big gala celebration. And when Mud passed the, the, the leading of the service on, he passed on to my father, Bob. And Eli became the, the music director, basically, <laughs> of our, our singer. And the whole thing became about having fun and celebrating the names. And I remember as a, uh, you know, a child when he would break out the banjo and we would sing uh, Diana as a group and Eli would have a call and repeat with the crowd on Diana and it was a it was a it was a wonderful celebration the years of Passover by the way usually come right after the national championship although <laughs> one year it actually came on the night Carolina played in the national championship <laughs> it was a religious nightmare <laughs> right he would he would often call out depending on what's happening in the final four he would call on people to the same in that fashion. And it really brought me a love of music very early. And uh and it's part of why I learned how to how to play guitar. Um, and then as years went on and the Passover service transferred over to me and my brother, my brother got the job of being in the service, and then it became my responsibility to take on for Eli's role of the music. Now we've added a bunch of music to it. Josh and I've added the raps and it'll be contemporary. And I'm not sure that everyone would have <laughs> But as we as we close here, I'm going to ask you for participation because I think Eli would appreciate this. We're going to give one final dynamic. Yeah. Let's sing it together. Who is this guitar played by? BB King. BB King. <laughs> I'm not BB King. <laughs> do a couple of notes for it. So when we get to the course. I want everybody to sing. If you don't know it, just come and let you know it. And let's sing the prize. I <laughs> We now come to the close of this first part of our celebration of your life by having the synagogue ceremony. And before we adjourn after the ceremony, I just want 
to invite anyone who would like to attend the Brilliant Night in German to follow the guitars, but it is warm, triple digit heat index for those of you who might uh, have trouble out there, please take care and do uh, the right thing. Scottish will be set at Waveside, we only do our Elmer and Peter.